The views and opinions expressed on the following program are not necessarily those of the staff and management of Salem Media of Hawaii. Welcome to Generations Radio, where the focus is on our seniors and their families. We are here each Saturday afternoon from 5 until 6 p.m., bringing you resourceful information with our radio team of professionals in the field of aging. Stay with us for the next one hour as we explore different ways to make life more exciting and meaningful for our extraordinary seniors. Right here on AM 690, The Answer. And now, here is our host and the publisher of Generations Magazine, Percy Ihara. And good afternoon, Hawaii. I am not Percy. I am Scott Spelina, the better looking host of the two. I'm a writer for Generations Magazine. I'm in charge of the Elder Abuse Unit. And today, I'm lucky enough to be the host of Generations Radio. Now, before you turn the dial to something entertaining, let me tell you something. You are in for a treat today because we have a very special guest star on Generations Radio. But let me tell you a little bit about Generations. Um, Percy Ihara, he's the publisher of Generations Magazine. For those of you who do not know what Generations Magazine is, I have two things to say to you. One is get out from under the rock you're living. It's a fantastic resource. And number two, it is free. That's right, free. Uh, for you cheapos out there, you can get it for free. Get two. Get one for your neighbor as well. It is a resource, a free resource that you can find at your public libraries, at your care homes, at downtown kiosks, at Big City Diner, at uh, uh Safeway um, and neighbor island people, you're not left out as well. You can get it as well. And in it has a ton of good information to seniors or anybody caring for seniors or anybody that wants to get old, read it. If you are 18 and over, you will find something interesting in that magazine. And so I encourage you to get that resource magazine and Listen to this radio. Now, let's say you're too lazy to get out of the house and find that magazine. What you can go ahead and do is you can use your computer and go to www.generations808.com and you'll be taken to a fantastic website where not only will you see the current issue of Generations Magazine, but the past issues of Generations Magazine as well as the past episodes of Generations Radio. Now, what's Generations Radio? It's a radio show that airs every Saturday from 5 to 6 p.m. on this station, 690 The Answer, as well as replays on Sunday from 3 to 4, the same station here. So if you're listening, if you're driving around Saturday, getting your errands done, you say, boy, I really like that Scott Spillane. He's a fantastic host. I like his jokes. I like what he says. I want to hear him again. I want to invite my friends and neighbors. We'll have sit around the radio like old timey times and listen to what he has to say. Come listen to us again on Sunday from three to four on 690. Um, the answer. Now, when I said that we have a very special speaker today, a very special guest on Generations, I wasn't saying that just because he's sitting two feet from me. Um, like, and I really mean it this time. I said it to all my guests that they're very special, but this one I actually mean. We have John McDermott from the Long-Term Care Ombudsman. Now, I'm going to have John explain what he does, but let me tell you, though, I envision whenever I picture John, and I've known him for years and years, I picture him as a sheriff in a Western, where he'll go to these towns like High Plains Drifter, Clint Eastwood kind guy. He'll go to these towns and clean them up. And then as he's riding off in the sunset to say, Mr. Mr., what's your name? And he'll look and there'll be a focus on his eyes. He's riding off in the sunset and he'll say, McDermott, John McDermott. So imagine that image when you see him or hear him talk today because he is a sheriff. Now, John, do I accurately describe what you do? No. <laughs> <laughs> now, now I feel like I'm supposed to say, do you feel lucky, punk? <laughs> right. No, I'm not the sheriff. Are you, are you the good, the bad, or the ugly? Uh, well, uh, I have a face that's perfect for radios. So, there you uh, go. I like that there. Yeah. Uh, the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program has been around since 1975. It, was, it started out as a demonstration project. And at that time, the only long-term care facilities were nursing homes. So it 
was called the nursing home ombudsman. Ombudsman is a Swedish word. Hawaii does not have a lot of Swedish speaking people. I was about to say, yeah. <laughs> so they don't know what I do. Uh, but ombudsman is a very old concept and it, it basically really means a, a go between somebody who works within, who knows who to talk to, how to get things fixed quickly so that the public don't feel like they're getting the runaround. So you're like, if I were to, and again, you're going to probably correct me if I'm wrong. You go into a department store, you go to customer service. Are you the customer service for the state for long-term care facilities? Uh, that's that's getting warmer <laughs> than Sarah. <laughs> You're getting closer there, Scott. <laughs> do I take a number to see you? Is that it there? No, you, you call do me I, do directly, I actually. Do I need a receipt yeah, to see you? People call me directly. 586-7268 is my direct line. And I get a lot of phone calls. Um, no, we started out, like I said, in 75, and the project was so successful that federal law, the Older Americans Act of 1965, was amended in 1978 requiring that every state must have a long-term care ombudsman program. And uh, so we have 50 states plus we have an ombudsman for Guam, for Puerto, I'm not, not for Guam, for, uh, yeah, Guam, I'm sorry, Guam, Puerto <laughs> Rico, and Washington, D.C. So we actually have 53 uh, long-term care ombudsman programs. And uh, so my job is to visit all 50 nursing homes, all 493 adult residential care homes, all 14 assisted living facilities, and all 1,145 community care foster family homes. And uh, the Administration on Aging would like that to be done quarterly. And uh, so if you do the math, we have 1,702 long-term care facilities. To visit quarterly would be about 28 visits a day. Wow. <laughs> Holy cow. So you and your army go into your fleet of cars, helicopters, boats, and go all over the state to manage to get that many a day. That's amazing that you knew that, Scott. <laughs> yeah, no. Unfortunately, um, right now I'm in office of two, myself and my volunteer coordinator, Susan Miyamoto. We definitely need more volunteers. Um, no, one of the problems that we have is that uh, in July of last year, the Executive Office on Aging was reorganized, and uh, I had an ombudsman specialist position which covered Oahu so that I could cover the neighbor islands, right. and that position was eliminated oh uh, without gosh. any conversation with me about the implications for our seniors. So, so that is uh, something that I'm still fighting, and uh, so as you can imagine, I'm. And let me tell you, I have seen you fight. I mean, you're a scrapper, son. I mean, when you go into uh, the big square building over there on uh, Baratania, you're ready to rock and roll for the seniors. Let me tell you, they have a good advocate there. It's like watching a Rocky movie. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> so anyway, um, we we really do need that position back because, as you can see, the numbers are really incredible. Um, and and actually, you know, the 12,340 residents that we have, some of them are able to advocate for themselves, and that's something that we always try to encourage. My background, I have a master's in social work, so empowerment is a word that we, we use quite a bit. But we do have residents with dementia, residents who have uh, no families really advocating on their behalf, or actually families who tell them, you know, mom, don't cause trouble. I don't want them to kick you out because uh, I can't take care of you. I work full time, and so you just gotta, you know, suck it up, local style, and, 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 that, and make that, the best of it. And that's the sad thing. And again, uh, point of seriousness here is that I'm the head of the elder abuse unit at the prosecutor's office, and one thing that we see constantly is people that need help, people that are desperate. Because let me tell you, if you find yourself in a caregiving situation, you become desperate. Very, very few people uh, have made plans to um, grow healthy and older in these five-star mega resort type of care homes. And they're forced to maybe go into a place that they don't want to. Or, more importantly, they don't want to go into any place. They want to age at home. Um, which a great many of our seniors do, but because of their disability, their injuries, with that, it's impossible for them to age at home. So they find themselves 
resentfully, reluctantly in a facility that may not meet their dream of growing old with dignity. And unfortunately, some of these places, they need regulation. They need oversight. And I think that's where you come in. Well, Hawaii is um, very unique uh, compared to the rest of the mainland in many ways. Um, because our real estate here is so expensive, because you know we're an island state, um, we have more two and three generations living under one roof than anywhere else in the United States. Right. And uh, so what that means is that um, if you're living with your grandparents, um, when you're young, those grandparents can help to babysit right. those children. And we see that all the time here. And then uh, when everybody's getting older, um, some of those kids who maybe are not working or have some free time, they can kind of care give their grandparents. So we don't really put people in long-term care facilities in this state unless they are so old and frail and needing professional help or paraprofessional help. The families just cannot do it anymore. And we also have a very generous legislature that has funded um, Kapuna Care, you know, programs for the elderly. People can call it the Aging and Disability Research Center, the ADRC, which is in every county office on aging. And they can um, talk to somebody who will uh, be basically a case manager and assess what kind of services do you need, support services that we can keep you at home, like meals on wheels, chore services, bathing services, transportation services. Um, because if you go into a facility and you eventually run out of money, which is the case for most people, right. you're on Medicaid, right. we're all footing the bill for that. And long-term care facilities, especially nursing homes, are about $15,000 a month. That's a lot of money. So the longer we keep people at home, it's a win-win for the taxpayer and it's a win for the seniors. Um, but there are people who, again, because of their disability, that's no longer an option. And so when they do go to those facilities, I, I tell people all the time, you know, we are all one stroke away from needing a long-term care facility. That's right. I have never met anybody in a long-term care facility who have said, I knew someday I would be in a care home or a foster home. I was looking forward to it. This is where I want to be. No, n nobody wants that. Everybody wants to be independent and staying in their own home. And so really everybody has a vested interest in making sure that we have a strong long-term care ombudsman program. Because when you're in that bed and you're feeling neglected or abused and nobody's coming to visit you and you're wondering, gee, where's that ombudsman? Well, when you were healthy, did you fight for my program? Did you fight for <laughs> adequate staffing? And I'll give you one quick example. Uh, a case that I've been working on, <clears throat> a woman uh, goes to see her therapist, talks to the social worker, has some complaints about the home um, the social worker calls me up. Can you go and check on the home? The okay. lady okay. sounds like she uh, is experiencing some kind of abuse. Um, was Adult Protective Services notified? Because they're the mandated reporting agency. Yeah, but they didn't take the case because it, it didn't fit into their parameter. And right. so they, they kind of weeded it out. I called up APS and they explained why, but they asked me if I would go in. Okay. <clears throat> I would go in and it turns out that this lady has uh, two sons, one who's disabled, and uh, she, because of uh, falling down, and uh, I don't know if she broke her leg or whatever, but she was getting therapy, and when she was ready to go home, her son let her know, uh, you're not coming home, I'm mm -hmm. putting you in a care home. Now, this is her house. Right, right. These are two sons who never married, who have lived there their whole lives, and the son said, you know, I'm taking care of brother. I can't take care of you as well. Mm -hmm. And so you have to go to a care home. I told this woman, well, you know, actually, because it is your house, you could call the police. You could call up somebody. Well, this is my son. I don't want to get him in trouble. I don't want him to be homeless. But he just made you homeless. Right. <laughs> well, it's this is Japanese family culture, you know, cannot do that. Oh and so no matter what home she goes to, she is never going to be happy because it's not what she wants. Of course. And this lady feeds herself, dresses herself, toilets, everything. And I said to her, I don't understand why you're even in a care home um, except for the walker. And uh, she said, well, I'm here because if I fall down, you know, somebody will pick me up. 
And I said, well, wait, if you go back to your own home and you're living with your two sons and you fall, nobody's going to pick you up? And there was a long pause. And then she said, I don't know. I, I don't know if they would pick me up. That's really tragic. And, and it is. And I think you uh, hit on a couple of things. Um, one is the importance, like you said, of being able to age in place as long as possible. Um, that's something that Percy Har and the Generations team has strived to educate the our Kapuna about being able to live at home as long as possible before having to make that difficult decision of whether or not they need to go into a care facility. And um, that excellent um, introduction into the Aging in Place conference happening um, being sponsored by Generations Magazine. And again, for those of you just tuning in, you're listening to Generations Radio, part of the Generations Network, um, being sponsored by Generations Magazine, a free publication around the island, um, published by Percy Ihara. And this um, August 20th at the Alamon Hotel, uh, from 8 to 2, I believe, is the Aging in Place Conference. There'll be over uh, 60 vendors, um, or exhibitors, I should say, 60 exhibitors um, there, uh, multiple speakers all day long to help anybody in a caregiving situation, anybody that feels they need a little bit of more information about how to age healthy at home. Unfortunately, life sometimes... Um, gives us a curveball to where it becomes unrealistic to age at home and you'll find yourself in a facility that you don't want to be in because you've always envisioned yourself as growing old at home the home that you have so many precious memories of raising your children in um, being married growing old with your spouse but uh, circumstances be it what they may you find yourself in a care facility and that's when um you may become introduced to the long-term care ombudsman or someone that cares for you may become introduced with the long-term care ombudsman, um, John McDermott. And it's frightening, uh, for those of you who missed the first part of the show, it's frightening the numbers that John gave us. Um, we're talking about hundreds, thousands of facilities that he's responsible for monitoring. And with his limited staff of himself and one other, it's impossible uh, for him to do it. I, and I'm reminded of um, that big um, oil spill that happened off the go coast and um, all those offshore oil rigs. They're being monitored. Hundreds of them were being monitored by one person. And um, unfortunately, had a huge tragedy. And I'm sure that John can spend the rest of the afternoon talking about the tragedies that he's encountered by improper monitoring and proper caregiving in these facilities. And we'll go into some of those stories later on. But uh, John, you mentioned that volunteers um, play a role in your office. We have um, certified about 180 volunteers since we started that program in 2001. I I've been the ombudsman since 1998. And so when I went to my first uh, NASOB conference, which is the National Association for State Ombudsman Programs, I found out that pretty much every state had volunteers. Mm -hmm. Hawaii at that time had just the ombudsman and the ombudsman specialist. Okay. So when I came back with all this uh, great information and uh, many of the states um, willingly gave me their training manuals for volunteers, uh, Georgia in particular gave me everything they had. And so my boss at the time, Marilyn Seeley, she was the director for EOA and um, several legislators and AARP, we were able to get funding to hire a full-time volunteer coordinator oh, and excellent. a clerical staff person. Excellent, excellent. So then we had a staff of four, and I thought, wow, this is incredible. You, you uh, doubled in size right there, yeah. baby. Yeah. However, you know, the Institute on Medicine uh, put out a study in 1995. It's called Real People, Real Problems, an Evaluation of the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program of the Older Americans Act. And back in 1995, this study recommended that there should be at least one full-time paid ombudsman for every 2,000 residents. Now, we what? have 12,000 residents, over 12,000, so we really should have six ombudsmen. And we're not anywhere near that. And, and as of right now, we have just one. 
So we, we, we're so far behind. And that study was written at a time when most of our long-term care residents were in nursing homes. It's much easier for me to visit a Halinani with 288 beds than to travel to, you know, 50 homes to see, you know, four people, five people right. per home. Right. So now um, our population is very spread out. In fact, sometimes when you hear folks on the mainland talk about the importance of balancing the Medicare budget, um, they're saying that uh, there has been a, um, a prejudice towards placing people in nursing homes and not out in the community. And nursing homes are, of course, the most expensive way to take care of people. But our state is actually quite the opposite because in our nursing homes, we only have 4,507 beds. But out in the community, when you add up the care homes, the foster homes, and assisted living, we have 7,849. Oh oh so it's almost twice as much. So, so, so you know, that, that's not an issue here. But when you're out in the community, of course, there's going to be less monitoring because uh, in a nursing home, you have three shifts. You have people who are not necessarily related to one another. If they see something that's not right, hopefully they will report it. And you also have lots of visitors. In these smaller homes, the staff is me and my spouse and my kids. And not likely that one of your family members is going to report you to Adult Protective Services for neglect or something like that. Right. And uh, they can put restrictions on visiting hours. I, I know of homes where <clears throat> you're required to call up in advance. Um, you're limited to uh, the, the time of day that you can come. I mean, really, this should be as open as possible. And, and I get calls at my office, the prosecutor's office, people <coughs> complaining that, hey, my mom is in this private home being cared for, and I can't visit her whenever I want to. What the, what the heck? Right. Now, it is a home, and people need to sleep and live a normal life, and so that's understandable. But, you know, your regular business hours of, you know, maybe from 9 to 5, something like that. And then, of course, a, a good home will make exceptions because if somebody works, you know, certain shifts and they can only visit later on, then you, you work that out. But for a home that has really unbelievable, you know, um, restrictions on when you can visit, to me, that's red flag, red flag, red flag. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, recently I was talking to somebody about the Raquel Bermisa case, which was uh, very infamous. Earl Anzai was the attorney general. It was the first time that any state went after a caregiver for manslaughter. Um, she thought she could beat it, so she was not interested in plea bargaining or anything like that. Uh -huh. um, but the woman who was in that home, Chieko Tanoe, she died of, you know, bed sores the mm. size of your fist. This mm. is a private pay. And um, there's a great shame when somebody in your family dies and others are looking at you like, well, did you visit? W were you not aware of what was going on? Didn't you talk to her? Yeah. Well, you know, and, blame, and, blame, blame. Right. And who is going to go visit their auntie and say, could you take off her clothes and flip her over? And I want to see if she's got any puka she's not supposed to have. You know, we, we trust these homes to do the right thing. And then we, when it doesn't happen, you know, it, it's, it's just so devastating. And, and I think you're bringing up some good points here that we're going to cover more after the uh, bottom of the hour break. Um, in particular, I want to hear more about that case as an example of just the tragedy that can happen in the care homes. And these are regulated care homes. These are supposedly professionals caring for our loved ones. And you can see just how neglect can turn into abuse, can turn into tragedy. And I'm sure that you in your job since 1995, was it? 98. 98, um, have seen cases and cases. And I want you to tell the people out there what they can do if they have a loved one in a care facility, how they can help make sure that their loved one remains happy and healthy as long as possible. So uh, thank you. You're listening to Generations Radio. We'll be back after this station break. from Generations Radio. If you have any questions or want to be part of our discussion, give us a call at 296-5467. That's 296 
5467. This is Generations Radio on AM 690, The Answer. Did you know 26 million Americans have kidney disease and most don't know it? The day I was diagnosed, I didn't know what to do. I called the National Kidney Foundation, and the young lady who answered stayed on the phone with me and walked me through step by step. She, too, was surviving kidney disease. And she showed me there could be life after kidney disease. Visit the National Kidney Foundation at kidney.org. Now you know. Moon Physical Therapy is here to help you back to recovery. Moon Physical Therapy is located on Ward Avenue across from Sports Authority. Physician prescribed for motor vehicle accidents, workman's comp, or that body pain that comes from rushing to play without warming up. Also event cardiopulmonary rehabilitation with our one-on-one patient care. Moon's Aqua Therapy heated endless pool allows for low impact exercise with less pain on land. We will give you the right exercises to get you back to health. Ask your doctor to prescribe moon physical therapy moon physical therapy we achieve results aloha this is martha clopin and al harrington choosing the right medicare plan not only saves you money it also helps you avoid headaches and heartaches down the road we want to remind everyone to listen to a medicare moment with martha sundays from 9 30 a.m to 10 a.m as we help answer important questions on medicare so you can stay healthy wealthy and wise all year long call me at 543-2073 543-2073 I was an addict from the age of 13. I finally decided it was time for a change. I walked into the Salvation Army Adult Rehabilitation Center, and that got me ready for the real world. Now, I choose to be guided by Jesus Christ, and today, I'm building a powerful and promising future, free from drugs and alcohol. Please shop at the Salvation Army Family Stores. With our discounted sales, your support through your purchase helps men live a clean, sober, and productive life. Got Vegas on your mind? Get Vacations Hawaii on the line. Vacations Hawaii offers weekly four- and five-night Honolulu to Vegas packages, which include three meals daily from $6.99. Stay at Hawaii's favorite casinos, California, Fremont, Main Street Station, and Orleans Hotel. Vacations Hawaii will get you there in comfort on deluxe wide-body 767 planes with complimentary in-flight hot meal service. Vacations Hawaii's frequent flyer program gives you future travel discounts and credits. So if you're ready to win big, call Vacations Hawaii at 591-4777 or visit pointvacationshawaii.com. Today, more than ever, we local people are living longer than any other state in the union with more seniors, baby boomers, and caregivers. Generations Radio promotes the importance to be proactive as we all age. The radio team will focus on issues facing our seniors and their families, finding resources to navigate healthy aging along with financial, legal, and caregiving information. So join Percy E. Howard from 5 until 6 each Saturday, right here on AM 690, The Answer. Focusing on the issues facing our seniors and their families today. Here's our Generations Radio host, Percy Ihara. And welcome back to Generations Radio. I am Scott Spelina. I'm one of the writers for Generations uh, Magazine. And right now you're listening to Generations Radio, a weekly show talking about all issues, elder-related, uh, helping our Kapuna live happy, healthy, and wise. Um, it's part of the Generations Network, part of the Generations Magazine, uh, which is a free publication offered statewide, published by Percy Ihara, the man, the myth, the legend. And it's a magazine that I write for. Um, second to the last page, usually, there will be an article written by myself about elder abuse. But also in this magazine is different resources uh, for caregiving, for aging in place, for anything. And speaking of aging in place, um, Generations Magazine is hosting a caregivers conference, um, or aging in place conference, I should say, um, August 20th at the Alamoana Hotel. Um, again, that's Saturday, August 20th. Please make it a point to be there. Um, there's going to be over 60 uh, exhibitors there. It's going to be all day long um, with Many, many speakers talking about Medicare, talking about safe um, aging issues, 
talking about a lot of things. They have celebrity uh, speakers like Dr. Shantani, AARP is always there. And it's a great resource found in one place, found in an entertaining venue that is uh, comfortable. The Alamon Hotel, um, I've been there for I think seven or eight years. Every year I go there. It's a fantastic uh, conference as well as I was just reminded by Percy um, that July 30th, um, there's a caregiver uh, workshop and you can find out details in the Generations Magazine, which is on the stands now. You can get that for free. Um, if you are listening to us this weekend, you're either listening to us on Saturday or Sunday. Uh, this show airs Saturday from uh, 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. and replays on Sunday. Additionally, if you miss us on the weekends, you can go to the website, um, www.generations808.com, where you can not only read online issues of Generations Magazine, both current and past, but you can listen at your own convenience to past episodes of Generations Radio. Now, today we have as an extra special um, guest, John McDermott. Why is it extra special? I have known this guy since the 80s. Believe it or not, we went to the same undergrad school together, Chaminade University. Go Silver Swords. And I've known him back then, and then it coincidentally, both him and I end up in the care, in the elder arena. Um, I being in charge of the elder abuse unit, and him being the long term care ombudsman. And before our break, um, he was talking about a tragic case that happened in one of our care facilities in Hawaii, where a certified care home owner. Uh, her neglect of somebody was so bad that it resulted in the death of one of her uh, patients she cared for. Now, John, I am sure that the case that you mentioned is not the only tragedy that you can uh, remember in your decades of being on this job. No, actually, um, on your website, I don't know if you still have it, but on the uh, city prosecutor website, they have lots of newspaper stories that have been covered and um, you know people people always ask me uh, uh, to share these horror stories I'm not I guess it's like uh, watching a car accident or something on TV and I'm not the mandated reporter for abuse cases uh, adult protective services right. is the mandated reporter so they really investigate these cases more than I do so um, a lot of the information that I have is kind of secondhand um, uh, but uh, just an example that could have been a tragic uh, situation. There was a woman, this was on um, Action Line, KHON TV Action Line, um, Alice Smith from Molokai. And she was living at um, Care Center of Honolulu, CCOH, used to be called Convalescent. And um, she went to dialysis and uh, she was picked up. And it seemed like the facility had no sign in, sign out procedures. So she was gone. She was supposed to be back. She didn't come back. Mm. And uh, uh, I think she was supposed to be back about eight o'clock. Family was notified around midnight that she still wasn't back. Of course, by now, dialysis has closed. Right, right. She ended up uh, in her wheelchair at Mayor Wright Housing, and it was a security guard who found her. And uh, um, the family, rightfully so, very upset that, you know, how, how could she be missing for this long? She could have been hurt. We have some, you know, dangerous people out there on the streets. And uh, um, this woman is still kind of um, experiencing some post-traumatic stress about this from what I, I was told by the family. And uh, so why was there not some kind of a policy on both sides? Um, the, the facility should know who's taking somebody out. There should be some kind of a sign-in, sign-out sheet. We have families that actually have restraining orders against members of their family. Right. And so what if she had been taken out by somebody who deliberately wanted to hurt her? And dialysis, why didn't they have some kind of a, a, a sign-in, sign-out as well so that they know that she was properly picked up? And um, 
so that you know the family from Molokai, because Molokai doesn't have any facilities anymore. Molokai used to have a nursing home that was part of um, Queen's Hospital. And when I first started, I, I think it was maybe 24 beds, but they decided not to um, um, continue that. So as people died or, or moved elsewhere, they did not replace them. So they were down to the last two, both comatose, and now they're gone. And so poor Molokai, the poorest of all of our islands, right. um, and the most Hawaiian, so the sense of ohana, very, very powerful there. And if you have a, a loved one that you cannot care for anymore, there's no place to put them on Molokai. You have to go to another island. And that means you're not going to be seeing them every day because airfare to Molokai is more expensive than the other islands. Really? Yeah. If you try buy a ticket, you'll, you'll see it's more expensive. That's crazy. So, so, you know, this family put their trust in CCOH and, uh, and that trust was violated. And so we're very lucky that she was not hurt, but that should have never happened. And those are more typical of, this, of the um, kind of cases that I get. Now, now, you get calls. I know you get calls because sometimes you call me saying, hey, Scott, listen to this call or whatever that or the situation that maybe you can help us out in. What would be a typical call? Um, someone saying, listen, I'm unhappy with this care facility. What, what's some of the complaints that you've handled? Okay, well, um, uh, I guess a common one is people feeling that they're not ready yet to be discharged, but the facility feels that they um, it's time to go. I have to sometimes do a lot of explaining to families about, for instance, with uh, Medicare. When you come into a nursing home, and let's say that you're there for physical therapy, so Medicare will cover that, uh, but people don't really understand that Medicare will only cover you if you are skilled. So um, not intermediate. Okay, I guess okay. I'm getting a little complicated. Uh, maybe this is a little technical. But um, so skilled is restorative therapy. I walk 20 feet, I walk 25, I walk 30. So long as I'm making a minimal amount of progress, yes. that's documented by the therapist, Medicare will continue. You have to have that progress. You have to have that progress. But most people will plateau. They, I reach 20, 30... 30, 30, I, I got no more to give, no more gas. Right, 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 right. Okay, well, that's when Medicare says, okay, that's no longer restorative therapy, that's maintenance therapy. Mm -hmm. That doesn't have to be done by a licensed professional therapist. That can be done by a certified nurse aide, a CNA, walking you up and down the hallway a couple of times to keep what you accomplished so that you don't backslide. So Medicare pulled out, and so now it's time to go home. Wow. But sometimes families, you know, we got used to not having to take care of grandma and take her to the bathroom and she eats so slow and so it takes forever to feed her and on and on and on. And so families or, or what happened to my family is when my father-in-law had a stroke suddenly and then he was at the care facility and then he was going to be discharged. It's like our house wasn't even ready to be discharged because you have to have the, the grab bar, grab bars, you have to have a wider door, ramps. you have to have ramps, you have to have all these things like that, that it's, it's like you said, I believe you said earlier, a lot of people are a stroke away from suddenly being thrust upon th them being in a caregiver situation, becoming a full-time caregiver to a loved one because a lot of us aren't millionaires. A right. lot of us and aren't going to be going to these four-star luxury uh, care facilities that have piped in music. Right. And historically, most of our caregivers are women. And so, you know, they kind of get taken advantage of here because if I'm a woman and I had to quit my job to take care of my parents or my in-laws, yeah. yep. um, I'm no longer contributing to my own social security. So when oh, yeah. I retire the amount of money that I have to live on is going to be so much less because I was not contributing when I was working full time, yeah. taking care of my loved ones, but not being compensated in any way. I mean, I wish that there was a way that we could either get federal or state law, something done so that whatever your salary was before you quit, uh, you we, get the credit for you it. get the credit for it. Yeah, yeah, um, no. I yeah, mean, because actually these folks are saving us taxpayers a lot of money because otherwise that person would be in a nursing home and we would be paying the 15000 a month for that. 
No, and that that you bring up a good point, and there's a lot of uh, women out there that find themselves because maybe the husband makes a little bit more than they do, and so therefore it's like, okay, I need to still work. You're better at uh, dealing with mom or dad, and so you become that insta nurse. You become the insta uh, caregiver like that, even though you're not trained to. Uh, we're going to force you in that situation, and you know what? You can get screwed later on in life when you yourself get old, and then you're not going to have the same uh, Social Security benefits. You're not going to have the same payoffs that I got because I went to work, um, and you just stayed at home taking care of mom and dad, not realizing that being a caregiver, you're busting your butt. You're not on the computer playing solitaire as your husband would be doing at work. Um, you're there changing adult diapers. You're there fixing meals. You're not there gabbing by the water cooler talking about American Idol. You're there uh, taking mom and dad to their doctor's appointments. Being a caregiver is a lot harder than going to work oftentimes. Yet, as John just demonstrated or um, illustrated, you're not appreciated um, oftentimes by the government later on in life. And that's a tragedy right there. Yeah, the caregivers, uh, whether they are um, taking care of their own family or running a care home or a foster home or working in a nursing home, I mean, we really have to give them credit because it's a very hard job. And uh, I remember I, I worked at Halinani for seven years before I became the ombudsman, and I worked at Maunalani for two years before that. So I, I've seen kind of both sides of the issues. And, uh, you know, a lot of care home, a lot of um, certified nurse aides, the American dream, everybody wants to be their own boss. Yeah. They want to run a business. They want to get rich. And so they think, oh, you know, I, I'll get the experience and then I'm going to start my own care home and life will be so wonderful. And they kind of forget, you know, that, well, wait a minute. When you worked at that nursing home, that was one shift. Mm -hmm. Now you're working all that. three shifts yep. Yep. and you don't yep. get Saturdays and Sundays off and there is no sick leave and there is no vacation time. And you better have family members that are willing to kind of support you and assist you because there are times when you are going to catch the flu, you are going to get a cold, you are going to need to stay in bed, and who's going to fill in for you because those other residents in the house need to be fed, need to be bathed, you know, whatever. So I, I don't think folks realize how much work goes into being a caregiver. And, and that's one thing that it was illustrated to me several years ago, um, one of the first care home abuse cases I got. Um, I was talking, uh, this was a nice well-recognized care facility that, I mean, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars to stay there, buy a unit there, whatever like that. And I was talking to the director there and she said, Scott, in order for us to make our overhead, in order for us to get all these luxury things, we rely so heavily on brand spanking new CNAs. Now these are kids that go to maybe KCC or some other um, Institute of Higher Education take like a 12 week or 24 uh, week course to get a CNA license. And then they're thrust into being a caregiver at these homes. And you look at some of these young kids out there caring for our Kapuna. I wouldn't trust them to care for my fish. And yet they're out there caring for our loved ones. And it's just crazy. And you're absolutely right. They get a little bit of experience and they say, you know what? I can do this. I can open up my own home. I have an extra room. I can care for uh, a stranger's uh, mother or dad like that, thinking that it's going to be duck soup when they take in someone suffering from Alzheimer's who doesn't sleep well at night, when they take in somebody that needs their dressing changed all the time or adult diapers changed all the time. And it's like, I can see where the caregiver stress creeps in there pretty quickly. I can see where the best intentions lead to tragedy when they're not trained adequately to take care of some of the more difficult patients they have to take care of. I can see where they don't have enough support staff to ease the burden of being a caregiver. And it, it saddens me that in your position, your one of your tasks is to oversee thousands of these facilities like this around the whole state and you're only one person along with um, 
a what ombudsman specialist you call them um that's the position i lost okay so <laughs> i have the vo- yeah, i have the volunteer coordinators well, well it's a good thing that you can leap to other islands in a single bound uh to take care of these thousands of places that you're responsible for um you mentioned earlier about the important role of volunteers if I were to have time and say, you know what, John McDermott and long-term care ombudsman, they play a vital role in making sure Kapuna live a happy, safe life, and I want a volunteer to help him and help those Kapuna, what would a volunteer do in your office? Scott, you do have time. <laughs> you, okay, everybody okay. has time to be a volunteer ombudsman. Um, okay. well, what, what would well, I do? What so I do? We, we have an application process, and uh, so we do a criminal background check. Um, uh, so if you've already been uh, convicted of um, stealing from some old man or woman, we don't want you. Okay. Um, but uh, we, we also require a TB clearance, and we provide 28 hours of training. Uh, we also do a reference check. And uh, then we assign you to a facility that is close to where you live or work so that it's easy for you to get there. And we ask that our volunteers visit their facility once a week, okay. anywhere from maybe two to four hours, and um, what you do is you talk story. Everybody in Hawaii knows how to talk story. Yeah. So, hi, my name is John. I'm with the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program. Have you ever heard of it? Um, do you have some time? Can I talk to you? Oh, so tell me about this place. You know, what do you think of it? And just kind of establish a rapport because if your first question is, you got any complaints, nobody in Hawaii is ever going to say anything. That's right. But if you first get to know that person, then they might start telling you things uh, when they feel they can trust you because everybody is afraid of retaliation. Yep. And actually, I can tell you f- for a fact, retaliation does happen. So, um, so you want to make sure that that ombudsman is going to protect you if um, things got worse because of something that you said. So um, we also have once a month a meeting with all of our volunteers and uh, we we do this also by webinar so that we can include the neighbor island volunteers. And so everybody's getting the same information. Everybody's sharing what's happening at their facilities. We don't want anybody going rogue and kind of doing their own thing. So <laughs> we want to make sure that people know we're, we're not inspectors. Um, we don't get badges? Oh, well, I'm not going to get a badge? Um, I'll make you a badge, so, but only for you. Can I get a baton? But, uh, no, no batons. <laughs> okay. You've got to draw the line somewhere. Oh, okay. So, but our volunteers, um, most of them have stayed for many years, not just one year. Well, I can see how rewarding it would be, actually. It's very rewarding. And, you know, we don't want somebody who just wants to be kind of a friendly visitor. Because if, if, if you just want to call bingo numbers, you can be a volunteer for the facility. They would love to have you. But if you're more interested in protecting our most vulnerable folks, then those are the kinds of people who we want. Um, but we are not adversarial. We're not confrontational. Like I said earlier, we do exit interviews with the administrator. We don't identify the complainant unless we have their permission. And uh, we're trying to make that facility better so that it's a win-win for the resident and for the facility so that when the state inspectors do show up, hopefully that facility will have no deficiencies because we helped to find them and fix them. Well, that's an awesome program. That, that, that is an awesome program, and I encourage people wanting to be part of the solution um, to give John a call at 586-7268. Again, that's 586-7268. Now, John, um, during one of the breaks, you are mentioning something about the neighbor islands and your concerns about that. Yes, yeah, since 2006, we've been trying to get funding from the legislature to have a full-time paid ombudsman on Kauai, on Maui, and on Hawaii, um, so the three other um, neighbor island counties. And that's because uh, every time I fly to a neighbor island, I'm wasting a lot of time with TSA um, because they, now... They, they search you? I mean. <laughs> um, yeah, well, no, no, no. But what I'm getting at is it used to be that um, before 9-11, you could practically show up at the last minute and now sometimes they want you there as much as two hours ahead of time, oh which is gosh, just ridiculous. And then, you know, you got to rent the car, you got to drive to the facility. So you're wasting a lot of time. It's 300 bucks basically every time I go to a neighbor island for the airfare, for the car rental, for the parking my car in Honolulu, and for the per diem. 
So it would be cheaper, much more effective, and, and better also because somebody from Kauai already has Kauai connections, yes. can work with the mayor, can work with the county council, can do those uh, evening and weekend activities like uh, community education, family councils, working with AARP chapters, all those things that would be very difficult for me because then I would also have to add the cost of um, a cheap hotel. Right. And uh, with my budget, it's more likely a tent. So, um, <laughs> so it just makes more sense to have those three positions. Now, this is the closest we ever came. The House and the Senate passed it. Okay. And then when everybody was in closed uh, conference, um, you know, talk, 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 it just disappeared. And uh, I was told it, was, it disappeared because it wasn't really an administrative bill. So this is something that we, we really need the support of the governor more than anything. The, I, I have been trying to talk to the governor for a while now. I went through the process of filling out the, applica the, uh, the e email um, and got no call back. And then I called uh, his office. Oh, somebody will call me back. Nobody has called me back. If your audience can do anything for me, is, okay, it's is your, call is your the phone governor. On. First of all, John, is yes. your phone on? Because I know that uh, Governor Ige, I'm sure, is responsive to if the, he's the needs of our Kapuna here. If he's listening, please tell him that he needs to speak to the long-term care ombudsman. We need to fix this program. We need to show that we really care about our most vulnerable population. We're the only state now with basically a staff of one. It's quite an embarrassment. Well, and, and I think that uh, when we talked earlier this week, you brought up a very good point about we are different from the mainland. Um, although we have aloha and we care about our family members, the reality is, is that our state is divided into islands, that different states in the union are, don't have the impediments of travel that you have do not have to get on a plane, do not have to rent a car, when they can just drive to the next county. And that's a economic reality that I think our state has to realize when comparing our state to some mainland states is that we do have one ombudsman that does want to do a competent job and our Kapunas deserve to have a competent job um, in what he does because he plays a vital role but we need to give John the resources to do that. And we are not like the mainland and that he just can't hop in his car and drive to the other counties. Um, so that's an excellent idea to have help, to have help stationed in the other islands. Because I know that not only do you go around seeing these thousands of, or trying to see these thousands of care facilities, but you do educate as well. And I've seen you out and about town um, educating people in how to get the most out of a care facility, how to look for some of the problems that might arise when you have a loved one in a care facility, um, how to be safe in a care facility. Um, John, we're approaching the end of our hour together. Um, any last thoughts? Well, I just want to thank you. This, this show, of course, is a form of community education. Um, you reach a lot of people. And so I just want to thank you for giving me this opportunity. Yeah, and I think the thanks goes out to Percy O'Hara and the Generations Network. Um, you can find Generations Magazine all over the state. Um, actually, I think now we're in Vegas because um, we've got so many locals going over there. Um, it's a tremendous resource in this issue of Generations Magazine. You will find um, information about the conferences happening July 30th on the Windward side, as well as the Caregiver or Aging in Place Conference, Aging in Place Conference happening August 20th. Uh, additionally, you are listening to Generations Radio, uh, which can be heard every Saturday and Sunday and also can be heard on the website generations808.com. Also on the website is a calendar of events, a calendar of senior events that I encourage anybody to uh, check out. Um, Hawaii is a very special place. We do care deeply for our kapuna as evidenced by the great work that John is doing at the long-term care ombudsman. And again, his number is 586-7268. And we encourage everybody that there are resources out there. If you find that you are in a facility yourself or you're concerned about somebody in a facility, 
there are people you can talk to. Um, you're not alone. And some of these facilities, they're managed uh, with people with tremendous heart. Unfortunately, they might be overwhelmed with the responsibilities they have. And so help John help them by getting involved. Thank you very much and have a great weekend.